We hope that you took the opportunity to watch the first video that introduced the engines and toured the upper grate before you watch this one, because things will make more sense if you do. Here in the second video, we will visit the mid-grade of Texas' starboard engine room. This is where air compressors and lube oil tanks can be found. More importantly, it is also the level from which the engine was controlled. A peek from here into the top of the crank pit will allow us to see the valve linkage that controlled timing of the steam as it entered and exhausted the cylinders. So here we are at the forward end of the mid-grade in the starboard engine room. And uh, once again, there's a few things to see even up here that don't necessarily mean a lot. First of all, we talked about the oil settling tank. Here's the bottom of that. You can see we also have thermometers on it that, uh, that can be used to uh, check the temperature. By the way, these also this is also where the oil was cooled because that oil would be quite hot coming out of the engine. Here's the bottom of the separator that uh, took water out of the steam. Um, here is a sight glass. You could look and see how much water had accumulated in it. You could then open this up and since there was uh, uh, as much as 290 pounds of steam pressure, you could open this valve and it would blow that water out, which you'd do periodically. And here we have again more water and steam pipes. Here is the top of the main water feed tank, also sometimes called a hot well. This is where feed water was brought from the uh, main condenser and, and once, it was, once it had been filtered and then from here it would be pumped and returned back to the boiler rooms. Now if we look back here, that large round cylinder is the forward end of the main condenser. This is where water was, uh, 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 where steam was condensed back into water. On this outside portion outboard portion of the engine you can see this large shaft that travels the full length of the engine that is the reversing shaft and we'll talk about that in a little more detail but hooked to that I guess it's worth a short climb to get over here this large device with levers and things coming out of it is the reversing engine it's a steam operated engine that's used to rotate this shaft back and forth and we'll talk about how that worked a little bit later but this is what they was the primary control for reversing the engine okay we're still on the mid grate level we're standing along the inboard side of the engine and there's a couple of things that are kind of structural mechanical details we want to point out if you look at a lot of the old reciprocating steam engines and uh, they'd usually build them up in the shop disassemble them and then rebuild them on the ship but the shop photos, you'll see these huge cast steel or cast iron uh, foundations and structures used to support it. This ship didn't use these. This was called a lightweight design. And what they had was large castings that you could see here and see here. And these connected to heavy forged steel cylindrical pipes that extended all the way down to the uh, bed plate or foundation for the engine. As you can see, they are also cross braced. So, and then each, you had one of these structures here and here. This is uh, directly adjacent to the low pressure cylinder. What we're looking at here, this kind of odd casting, is called a crosshead guide. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. But this made for it wasn't while it wasn't light. It was certainly lighter weight than the old design, and it was extremely rigid. One other thing is this black pipe that runs here. You can see there's a series of little valves on it that are spaced. And here, this was a lube feed oil that went to the crossheads. It was extremely critical. We'll talk about that later also. Now we're going to go past the control station. We'll come back to that just because we'll kind of complete what's in here. Further aft, we have these pumps here and there's two more pumps over here these are actually steam operated air compressors these are original to the ship 1912 design these are what provided compressed air uh, used throughout the ship and primarily the gas ejector systems for both the uh, 14 inch guns and 5 inch guns and if you uh, watch any of the uh, 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 videos 
talking about guns and turrets, you'll know how extremely important these were. So we have four in this engine room. We also have four in the other engine room. Now, uh, what's unique to this engine room is we see this large black device there and also those black cylinders on that bulkhead. This is the steam-operated steering engine. Now, we're not going to talk about that today, and we might try to do a separate video sometime in the not-too-distant future on it. So, as we walk around, we'll see the tops of some other pumps that we will certainly talk about once we get done on the lower grate level. This is the aft end of the uh, main condenser. Once again, this is what was used to convert waste steam back into water, water and feed water. Now, we're looking at the aft end of the reversing shaft here, and this attaches to these odd links, the mechanisms. This is called a Stevenson linkage. This is what was used to make the engine run in forward or reverse. And in order to do that, we had to drive through what were called eccentrics. If you look, let's see if we can get down past there. When we get to the lower engine grate, we'll show them better. But you can see that there are rods, two rods that extend down at slight angles, uh, and they attach to some devices there. Those are called eccentrics. The eccentrics are perfect circles that are mounted on the crankshaft, but they're mounted off center. So as the crankshaft turns, those uh, provide kind of an up and down motion on these rods. Now, since the engine is a double acting engine, uh, it, each piston fires at a zero degrees and 180 degrees to make it run in reverse. You have to change it out of phase by 90 degrees so that it fires at 90 and at 270. In order to do that, these uh, eccentrics are mounted 90 degrees apart as far as being off center. So that means that these two rods are pushing up and down uh, by, and they're off by 90 degrees. Now, in order to make the engine run in reverse, we use the Stevenson linkage. When that uh, reversing shaft turns, that arm pushes what's called a suspension rod. And if we look, we can see there's two of them. There's one on each side of the actual link. Now, this link, this curved section here, you can see there's an eccentric rod attached to this end and one at this end. In the center where that the suspension rods are attached, you can see that it's kind of mounted to a, what looks kind of like a shoe there. That entire link slides in that shoe. That kind of greenish black part there is a bearing surface. And in fact, there's a little oil cup used to put some oil in and lubricate it from time to time. But in any case, when that reversing uh, arm shaft turns, it pulls that link to where e either one of the uh, eccentric rods is directly under the, what's called the crosshead or the other. When one of them is directly under it, it pushes this crosshead up and down. Each end of the crosshead is attached to the uh, valve stems that, uh, I, that actually push the valve pistons up and down. So with one eccentric under it, that uh, crosshead pushes the valves up and down and then admits the steam and exhausts the steam out of the in and out of the, the uh, steam pistons. If you want to reverse, by turning the reversing shaft, the Stevenson linkage is pushed to where the other eccentric is under it. That makes things run 90 degrees out and the engine reverses. So that's how it works. Now let's go forward to the control. So here we are, we're still on mid-grate in the starboard engine room, and we're now about mid amidships on the engine, and we're at the control stand. This is where uh, the engine was operated. Now the first thing I want to show you is uh, how they received orders uh, to determine engine speed. Now what we see here, of course, and what I think most people would recognize is called an engine order telegraph. And it was uh, by using this that the uh, the bridge, the navigation bridge, could signal down and tell them in very general terms how fast or slow they wanted to turn the engines. Now, since these are direct drive engines, that means that if the uh, engine was turning at 100 RPM, so are the propellers. 
They weren't so much interested in knowing exactly what speed they needed to travel here. What they needed to know is how fast they want the engine, the bridge wants the engines to rotate. Now with this, it was, again, it's just a very general indication because this just indicates stop ahead one-third, two-thirds, standard, full, and flank, or back one-third, two-thirds, and full. That's kind of like telling somebody driving a car, I want you to go slow, kind of fast, or really fast. Now in order to, get to pr know precisely what they wanted on the bridge, which was uh, very frequent, they would use this rev engine revolutions indicator. With this uh, the, on the bridge, they would turn the three knobs to set it for the specific RPMs they wanted. And uh, a bell would ring, they could look down here, and then they could turn knobs that were originally on here but had been vandalized by people in the past, and they could turn the dials to match it, and that confirmed to the bridge that they knew exactly what they wanted. So that's how basic communications happened from the bridge or elsewhere. Now some of these controls, this very large wheel here, is the um, main throttle valve and this is what they used to control the steam. You can see they could not only open and close it, but here's a little lever they could lock it in position where it wouldn't inadvertently uh, be changed by somebody bumping into it or vibrations moving it. Now beside the main throttle valve is the reversing lever. By moving this they could make the engine either uh, run forward or reverse and we'll talk about how that happened later. We also have other valve wheels. One of them is a, uh, is, provides a steam to the balance to the main throttle valve. Uh, we also have bypasses, that kind of thing. These red levers here operated, uh, operated uh, drains on the four cylinders. Now, like it or not, uh, water would condense out of the, in, in the cylinders and gather in the bottoms of them and this created some problems. Uh, the boiler room chief, or, I'm sorry, the engine room chief uh, would very likely hear that problem with a little bit of crackling or popping noise so they could quickly open and shut each one of these that would blow that uh, condensate out of each cylinder. Now above that we have uh, tachometers, one for the port engine and one for the starboard engine. And with this, they could tell exactly how fast or slow, let me turn that light down, there we go, how fast or slow uh, not only their engine but the other was turning because they needed to know very precisely so that they could uh, balance the two output of the two engines. There we are. Now, and uh, we'll see later on, uh, in, when we're down in the engine pit, we'll, I'm sorry, the uh, first grate, We'll go back to the, sha uh, the shaft alley and you'll see what ran this. Above this was a revolution counter. This hooked to a mechanical linkage that uh, every time the engine turned over would bump this little lever arm and with that you could count the total number of revolutions that the engine has gone through. We have a clock. Now we also have uh, uh, this black, let me turn the light back up. We also have this black pipe that runs the length of the engine, and you'll see spaced along it, as I described before, valves that they could use to open or close and uh, can provide feed oil to a number of, uh, of moving parts in the engine that's part of the forced lubrication system. Now one last thing I want to show you that's I think it's pretty high up on the cool factor is this plaque here. I'm going to try to focus in on it. And this provides information, uh, acceleration, rate of change of speed. It tells you uh, the RPM, the number of, uh, within a range, the number of knots uh, that would change. Uh, it also told you how long it would get to it. So with this, they, they pretty well knew exactly what to expect uh, uh, from any engine speed and any change. Now the one last thing I want to show you is let's turn around. What, uh, even though we controlled things, what we haven't determined is exactly what's going on in each piston. So on this side, we have pressure gauges. And with this we have, here's the intermediate pressure gauge for the intermediate cylinder. You can see that it red lines at 125 PSI. To the right of that is main incoming steam for, for this engine, the starboard engine. 
and you can see it maxes out at 295 PSI. To the right of that is the steam main pressure for the port engine because remember in battle conditions they would operate these engines on two separate steam systems and it was very good to know exactly what the pressure was on the other engine. Now below that we have the main condenser pressure gauge. This is not measured in PSI but in, in inches of mercury and with this uh, they actually measured vacuum. So uh, because when they condensed water, uh, water from the steam that sudden change in state would actually create a vacuum on the engine and we'll talk about that in a little bit. To the right of this is the low pressure cylinder uh, pressure and it actually redlines at 40 PSI. Typically under operating conditions it ran at uh, the input steam input at around 25 PSI. Now for whatever reason, I don't know, but they have a rudder angle indicator in here. Uh, and again, I have no idea why they would need to know what the rudder angle is, but here it is. Now another thing is they had to have very good communications, not only to back to the navigation bridge, but to, uh, to the boiler rooms in any number of places. So first of all, they uh, have a, uh, uh, an intercom system here to where an engine room chief could call out general orders to everybody in the room. We also had telephones. Here's a battle telephone here, sound powered. We also had power telephones here, and uh, you could see that they could actually have up to three people at a time talking. Not that they needed to, but it was there. Now the last thing to show you is a critical piece of equipment, and that's this salinity meter. Uh, this allowed them to switch and look at, uh, at different, uh, different feed waters, and what they were always looking for was salt in it. Uh, the uh, main condenser, which we'll take a look at, um, has thousands of tubes in it that the steam traveled through and, and cold seawater flowed over it and with that it condensed the steam back into water. But with those thousands of tubes there's also thousands of joints. If any of those joints leak then it pulled seawater into the uh, boiler feed water and that's a pretty bad thing. So this allowed them to constantly check on that. If they started seeing ra a raise in salinity then they could cut off the feed water or the, the supply of steam at that point and switch over to something else. So that's basically how the engine operated.